and welcome to Landscape Photography World, the podcast for everyone passionate about landscape photography. I'm Grant Swinburne and I'll be your host on this show discussing the wonderful world of landscape photography. This time I'm talking to Vonda Craswell. With years of travel, hospitality, tour guiding and business experience, Von has a compassionate and patient understanding of what it feels like to be a beginner photographer. Educated with a BA and postgrad studies in small business management and tourism, environment and culture, as well as NDIS training, it's a natural progression for her to combine skills and passion into creating small group photography workshops and tours. Born in Sydney, Australia, she's lived on the spectacular Sunshine Coast in Queensland for over 20 years. After growing up in Canada and then travelling, working and living in Alice Springs, Cairns, Darwin and the Kimberley for many years. An enthusiastic global traveller, having lived on three continents and travelled to seven, she shares her passion for photography, speaking about her fascinating life story, motivating others to improve their own photography, especially landscape photography, and embracing the excitement of discovering new places. Vaughn is available for speaking engagements, private tuition, workshops and tours. I hope you enjoy the show. Hi Vaughn, welcome to the podcast. How are you going? I'm pretty good today. How are you, Grant? I'm very good. Very pleased to have you on the show. Uh, I've been following your work for a while uh, and very pleased when you said yes. So uh, thank you very much for that. Oh, thanks for asking me. I feel very humble, actually. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Well, I'm I'm very humble about my podcast. I don't uh, don't have any pretense. The, the the best for podcast out there, though it really is the best podcast out there. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> so, what's the uh, Von Craswell story? Wow, where do I start? Um, for photography, or just me personally in general? Wherever you want. Who, who is who is Von mm. Craswell? Well, I, I guess I have Polish heritage. I've lived in the UK, Canada and Australia. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been in Australia again now about 30 years. Um, okay. This is pretty much my home now. So uh, my immediate family is all still in Canada at okay. the moment. Where, whereabouts in Canada? Uh, my mum lives in Ottawa, so I spent uh, about 20 years there from when I was uh, about six months old to my early 20s when I decided to come back to Australia. Cool. And, th and then I never left. I came back for a year, but I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, why not? You, I, I think it's the best place in the world, personally, but, you know. Uh, I do, too. It's pretty fabulous. Yep. Uh, well, initially, I so I had learned to scuba dive in Canada, and I obviously there's dark lakes and not a lot of tropical fish happening in Canada. And my plan was to get work um, around the Great Barrier Reef. So I flew to Cairns and I got myself a little job as a volunteer hostie on a dive boat. Uh, nice. So I just got to dive for free. And then through that, I ended up getting a position as a cook on one of the dive boats. So Fantastic. we'd go out to sea three, between three and seven days at a time. And I was cooking for up to about 35 people on wow. a boat. Yeah, which was pretty cool. And yeah. the diving was amazing. I actually fell in love with photography then. Well, I fell in love with photography then, but that was back in the days with, uh, you know, pre-digital. So with yeah. slides and I didn't know anything about it. We taught it on one of the dive boats I worked on. So I tried to pick up a few things, but it, I found it very difficult to be honest. So yeah, that was kind of a short-lived um, career. <laughs> I probably did more videoing back then, to be honest, but yeah. Uh, so I lived, yeah, I lived there for a while, a couple of years, and then I married an Aussie guy, a dive instructor, of course, and we Excellent. went traveling around Australia, <laughs> and then we ended up in the Kimberley. So we were tour guides in the Kimberley for uh, four seasons. Nice. Which again was pre-digital photography. So nobody, you know, you didn't have phones or internet or cameras or like it no was Instagram. All, yeah. No Instagram, <laughs> no Facebook. Back in the day, it was it was really good days, I have to say, but I, I have hardly any photos of that time, obviously, yeah, which is yeah. a shame because we saw amazing things and it was the Kimberly 
really untouched. I don't even know what it's like now. Probably a lot more uh, full of people, I would say. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to remember the last time I was there would have been 2006, I think, went to Broome and parts of the Kimberley. Yeah. I didn't, didn't get a lot. We were only there uh, for about a week and uh, I'd, you could literally spend a couple of years there easily oh, exploring definitely. and not see all of it, you know. Yeah, yeah. It was it was pretty incredible, actually. So that that was a an amazing time in my life. But it was also quite exhausting because uh, we were with clients 24-7. Yeah. Uh, didn't really have a break in the season. So we, uh, my husband and I, my ex-husband, did 13-day circles around the Kimberley in a big four-wheel drive thing. We took 12 passengers yep. and we would just go round and round and round from sort of April to October. So by the time October rolled around, we were pretty stuffed, <laughs> to be honest. I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, there, there's there's not a lot of accommodation in that part of the world. So what, were you just... No, we were camping. We yeah. were camping. So every... We did camping tours. So every night we would help people set up a tent or I would try and convince people to just sleep in a swag. And for some people, that was the first time they had done it ever in yeah, their life. So it's pretty daunting for a lot of people. We also it's had a lot of... It's a clients. very different experience to sleeping in a tent, isn't it? The swag. It's, oh, definitely. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, it's basically kind of a canvas sleeping bag with a bit of a hood. Yeah. That sort yeah. Of cover, cover, cover and you're just on the ground, you know. And it's on yeah. the ground, yeah. <laughs> on the ground. So, and we, you know, a lot of our, this, this particular tour we did was, I guess, um, aimed more towards retired professionals from Victoria and New South Wales, you know, so oh. doctors and lawyers and things that had never been out in the bush before. So it was all very exciting and scary for, for people. But at the end of the trip, they they were in love. I mean, they, they thought it was amazing. It's an yeah. amazing part of the world. Yeah. Can't wait to go back with a no. camera <laughs> this time. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I'd, I'd love to get back there. As I say, 2006, so I think I was... Uh, Still uh, playing about with, um, in, in terms of digital, still playing around with the uh, little Canon Nexus Happy Snapper, not a, uh, oh, yeah. I didn't have a DSLR at the time. I had the uh, the, the um, Minolta film camera, but um, oh, right. yeah, didn't, didn't get a lot of anything but family sort of stuff there. So well, it wasn't it's funny, my, my dad tried to teach me photography. He, he actually did a lot of black and white photography. Okay. Um, beautiful portraits and, and things like that and he developed his own film and one year I was going to Mexico and I said oh can I borrow your camera and he said okay I'll, I'll just show you quickly how it works you know and I just had no idea what he was talking about <laughs> and I, I didn't have much success because obviously it was all manual settings and I um, yeah I, I just had no idea what I was doing so that that was my photography career like start and finish in <laughs> a week that was about it didn't pick up a camera again for many, many years. So, so was that the first time you'd picked up a camera, or did you? Uh, sort yeah, of I guess so. And I and yeah. I I ended up getting into photography, funnily enough, because of Instagram. So it was around probably about 12, 13 years ago when Instagram came to yep. Australia, and I was newly divorced, and I was trying to find old friends and just, just you know look at different things sure. and I hopped on Instagram and at the time I thought it was only for phone photos you know so I was taking photos with my phone of different yeah. things and posting well, I, I guess it really well, that, that was what really made it wasn't it you know well that was kind of the premise I think at the beginning yeah. was you know you take a quick photo with your phone and you post it straight and you away post it and then right away yeah yeah, and then after a while, I, I was like, wow, there's some really amazing photos. How can they be phone photos? I was I was just stunned. Like, how do they take this, you know, pre-dawn photo with the sun? Like, anyway. Yeah, and I, and with I, uh, phone uh, technology at the time as well. Yes, and so I kind of got wise to it and realised people were actually taking photos with a camera and then posting them to Instagram. So that was like a light bulb moment. And I thought... I kind of want to take better photos myself, you know, how, how do I do that? And that kind of, I guess, started me going. So oh. um, I was also doing quite a bit of traveling back then. So I planned a trip to the Galapagos Islands in Ecuador. Nice. And I thought, I kind of like to take some really great photos. Um, and of course, like everyone, when they first buy a camera, they're like, oh, 
it's like a DSLR. I'm going to take great photos and then you yeah, come I've back and you're a bit yeah. disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> then you're kind of disappointed and you're thinking, oh, that didn't quite work out how I envisaged my yeah, photography. Er everything on auto shooting in JPEG, etc. Yeah, <laughs> been there, done that. <laughs> yeah, so that, so that was like a little bit of an eye opener for me. I ended up shooting in auto most of the time and I really didn't get shots that I was proud of, but I had a great, great time. It was an amazing trip. So I can't, I can't argue with that. And then, then I was planning a trip to Antarctica um, and I thought, okay, maybe now I'll learn a little bit more about photography because I am not coming home from Antarctica without awesome pictures. So. Yeah. I found a local photographer and I did a couple of lessons with him and he sort of started teaching me manual settings and yeah. we just tried a lot of different things like, uh, you know, panning or um, uh, photographing a balloon full of water that you pierce and it explodes with water and, you know, we did a few little tricks like that and, and I thought, at the time, actually, I thought I'm going to become a dog photographer, like a pet okay. photographer with just dogs. This was before this was a huge thing. Yeah, yeah. And it's a massive Yeah, event. and <laughs> I was convinced, you know, I was like, that is my career, dog photographer. So, yeah, that didn't work out too well either. I, I just found it quite difficult, actually, to find people who are willing to let me photograph their dog. And yeah. dogs are, like, crazy and unpredictable, and they, you know... I live near the beach, so there's a lot of sand, and oh, I thought, no, I'm not sure that this is really for me. <laughs> and then I and then I discovered that I quite liked being by myself with my camera in nature. I, I found it very super relaxing, and the landscape doesn't really talk back to you, and you don't have to tell it what to do. And yep, it does its you know, thing. You you record it, kind of. Yeah, so it was quite. Uh, quite an eye opener. So I thought, oh, no, I actually don't mind landscape photography. And I started to do a few portraits. So I still do a few portraits now. I do some wet, you know, uh, for businesses for their internet, you know, their websites, yeah, yeah. corporate like a yoga yeah. business or whatever. I do photos like that. But okay. wow, I guess I really fell in love with landscape. Like I really fell in love with landscape. I just find nature pretty incredible. I was brought up to appreciate and respect nature. My parents were yeah. very greeny and they were very, um, I guess you could almost call them hippies, you know, way, way back years, you know, when I was small, like I'm 54. So it was quite a long time ago. They were doing composting and they weren't using plastic and, you know, they yeah. already had it sorted out 45 years ago. Yeah. Uh, so I grew I grew up with a real respect of nature, watching David Attenborough documentaries, and yeah, I guess I started to fall in love with the nature more when I worked on the Great Barrier Reef because obviously yeah, yeah. I was scuba diving every day, and the nature uh, it's an incredible it's an incredible world down there. The relationships between fish and uh, I don't know it's yeah it's pretty amazing. So I kind of really cemented that when I started photographing landscapes. I thought nature is incredible. It's always different. Yeah, amazing. No, oh, great, great. So what um, made you decide to go into photography full time and particularly sort of landscape and how did you kind of come to that decision that that was what you wanted to do? Yeah, so that was, it was quite a long process because I think like everyone who wants to be a photographer full time, you kind of have this romantic image of. Oh, you just take photos and you put them on. Take photos and people <laughs> buy them and everything's great. Uh, so I enjoyed taking photos for a number of years and I, I still had an office job. So I was working in an office um, and doing photographs on the weekends and messing about with portraits and dogs and you know just trying different things and I guess I, I always had instilled in me you know quite a strong work ethic and mm -hmm. not depending on handouts and things like that and I, I kept thinking you know I have a mortgage to pay like I I don't have the freedom to just toddle around and do what I like I have to have a secure income so just going back a bit, when I was married, my ex decided to become a wedding photographer. And so we had that issue already where he had a 
you know, some weeks he'd make $20,000 for a wedding and other times he'd make nothing for three weeks, right. you know, so it was very difficult to like, one of us had to have a secure job. And so that was always in the back of my mind. Like I really need to make sure I have it all together because I, I got nothing backing me up. So continued to work in an office, um, started to go to university as well. I, at 40, I, I thought, well, I've never been to university. I'm going to give that a go. And so that went on for, well, I'm still going to, I'm going to uni now, actually, I'm going to Utah's right now. So okay, cool. yeah, so that kept me going as well. And then it kind of forced my hand because the business I worked for for 20 years decided to sell and the company who bought them out didn't really have room for my position. I was sort of the office yeah. facilitator. And so it kind of forced me in one way to make a decision like, am I going to go and work in another boring office and like, <laughs> or am I going to try and take a plunge and do photography full time? And what does that look like? And so that was only at the beginning of uh, 20. 19 actually okay. and i had saved up quite a bit of money and i spent it all in that first year doing like research trips to tasmania and upgrading my equipment uh getting insurances like it's it's a huge minefield it's not something you can consider lightly and i didn't consider it lightly i i was very very focused yeah, you've really got to do your research and understand you have to do what, your research you're getting definitely into. yeah 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 so it was a big process and i was finally able to run a trip to tasmania in november 2019 cool. and it was awesome. Like every, everything came together. Um, the ladies I had on the trip were awesome. Everything was perfect. Like I learned a lot from doing it. You know, how could I improve next time? Do I need to change anything? So it was all good. So actually 2020 was going to be woo, my big year yep. of <laughs> <boom here. Yeah. laughs> world was domination. There's a lot of people <laughs> boom here, I think. <laughs> I had, yeah, I had big plans. <laughs> Kind of didn't work out that way. And also that year I had gone to Eastern Canada and I had researched uh, doing a tour over there. So it involved a lot of speaking to people, uh, my own research, photos, traveling, you know, it was quite an intensive trip. And part of that reason was I wanted to be able to go to Canada more often to see my mom. Sure. And I thought if I ran a tour over there once or twice a year, yeah, you can um, in and have a cup of <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Get my washing done. <laughs> so, so that was that was a that was a crushing blow, actually. Uh, uh, twenty twenty, yeah, it all it all kind of fell apart. So, you know, what I've been doing is uh, lots of workshops up in Harvey Bay, which yep. is a couple of hours north of here. Uh, I'm still, you know, I'm still planning to get back to Tasmania as soon as possible, but it's. Uh, I just I just can't take people's money thinking that they're going to do a tour and then it all falls apart. All falls so I, until I'm you know yeah. until I'm reasonably sure what what's happening and I have heard that Tasmania is looking to ban unvaccinated travelers coming to their state. Um, so that's something I have to look at for my business as well. Like I'm fully vaccinated and. Yep. Yeah, I just think that's a kind of something serious that you have to look at in the future. Uh, yeah, definitely. I, and I think that's going to be a, a big part of a lot of businesses where there's face-to-face -face contact that, you know, if you, yeah. if you are going to be in reasonably close proximity to people, you know, you all get on the same yeah. bus or camper van or whatever, then, yeah. you know, it's... It, it's yeah, gonna... and so I still, I mean, during, during this... Since COVID, I, I have actually run some workshops locally and, and in Harvey Bay and wearing masks and, you know, hand sanitizer. And it's it's really not, I'm a hugger. I love hugging people. And, you yeah. know, it's, it's been really difficult, actually. It's, it's changed a lot of things, I know, for a lot of people. So that's that's been a challenge, but I'll, I'll keep going forward, you know. So has it, has it changed your attitude towards the travelling part? You know, I mean, obviously you're doing the the, the more local workshops at the moment, but, uh, I mean, you mentioned mm -hmm. wanting to go back to Tasmania. Is it something you'd reconsider in terms of going to uh, some locations worldwide or? 
Yeah, I, I think I'm probably going to concentrate more on Australian locations. So I, I have a couple actually in mind that I still need to go and research and, and sort of put an itinerary together. But uh, I, I am looking at somewhere in South Australia. Um, and I'm looking at things that are a little bit different than the norm, like everyone goes to the Great Ocean Road and everyone go, you know, I, I kind of want to have things where people get a different experience and not necessarily just landscape. Uh, so yeah. what I was working into my tours in Tasmania is something with a more personal touch, meeting some locals. Uh, okay. I had on my on my Tasmania trip, we I organized a, a little tour of a back behind the scenes tour of an oyster farm. So I sourced an oyster farm, lovely people. And they, you know, we had to get high vis jackets and they let us come in and, and watch the boys bring, you know, come in with the boat with the oysters. And we were able to photograph them, like pulling the oysters out and yeah, sorting them and right. bagging them which is pretty awesome so i i really enjoy that kind of thing it's not necessarily landscape but there's plenty of things to photograph that aren't Absolutely, landscape. yeah i mean but that that sort of documentary sort of style thing yeah. i think you know that that that's very interesting to to, to a lot of people and uh you definitely know, yeah. and my experience in in the kimberley also ha has shown me that People might have a, a main interest in one thing, but that doesn't mean they're closed to learning about other things. No, and absolutely. I, yeah. I really, you know, so my my focus really this year, I guess, is uh, learning more about Tasmania. And, and when I finally get there, I mean, I'm looking at spending sort of extended periods of time down there, to be honest, yeah, right. to, to do more research and learn more. And mm. I would like to incorporate something to do with uh, Indigenous um, lifestyle or businesses things like that so i'm always looking at um i guess something to set me uh, a little bit apart from the average tour there yeah just yeah just just going and taking photos all right we're going to be at this spot for dawn and this place for sunset and yeah i mean we'll go and have lunch or whatever you know yeah yeah i mean i definitely think there's there's more of interest and and you have to remember, like a lot of people might come on a landscape photography tour, but they might like other photos too. They Absolutely. might not necessarily yeah. just be uh, totally focused on landscapes. And there's a lot more to see. You can still shoot landscapes during the day or if it's raining or, you know. Well, I mean, you wild, wildlife photographers, you know, I mean, do, doing that, sometimes sunrise and sunset is okay, but it's usually yeah. not the best kind of lighting necessarily for, yeah. for that wildlife. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. 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 So I'm so, just trying to, I'm, I'm really focused on building my community in Tasmania. That's, that's yeah. my number one project. Um, and then definitely other places. A um, couple of, oh, was a couple of months ago, I guess I went, I did a three week road trip up in North Queensland and the Outback. Oh, yeah. And I mean, I love, I love the Outback. I, I really like places where there's not a lot of people, to be honest. Yeah. I'm, I'm the yeah. same. Yeah. The, the <laughs> fewer people, the better. Relaxing. Yes, I don't get definitely. in frame then. <laughs> well, that, that's true too, yes. Yeah. I just, I love the outback. I mean, I've been traveling around the outback. Uh, I guess I've lived in Queensland for, you know, 30 years or something. And I, yeah. I just never get tired of the outback. I think it's incredible, beautiful, rugged. And I guess what some people say about my photography style is I can look at something that's kind of ugly at first sight, but make it look amazing, you know, and, yeah. and that, that's how I feel about the Outback. You could look at it and go, wow, it's bleak and dry and boring. Yeah. But dry, dusty, so yeah. dead trees. Yeah. But those dead trees make fascinating subjects. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. definitely I am looking at other places to do tours. I have a feeling that probably the next four or five years, it's really going to be Australia uh, that I've got to focus yeah, on. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just think that's the safer option. And also, we don't know what flight prices are going to be like. And no, that's very true. Um, I mean, even for Tasmania, I kind of have to rethink all my pricing because obviously now things like car hire and accommodation and everything's kind of gone up quite a bit in price. So yeah, yeah. that's going to be interesting to see if people are willing to pay that extra cost. Yeah, you know? yeah. I've I've had a look at a couple of overseas uh, trips and 
um, I've noticed that, you know, since I was looking at them in 20 or early 2020 and, uh, and yeah. whatever, um, not just the flights, but, you know, the, these were like photography tours and that sort of thing. And, yeah, the prices have just started to, you know, go through the roof. And, uh, yeah, yeah I, th I think that's that's going to be a big test as to who... Yeah who who's going to pay that kind of money for uh, a, um, a a photo trip you know yeah and and i mean what i see for my business too is having repeat clients you know so someone yeah. might come with me for a weekend workshop in harvey bay and then they go oh i kind of wouldn't mind going to tasmania i've already been with bond on a weekend and i know i can trust what she's saying yeah. is right and she'll deliver and and you know and then they might go to South Australia with me next time. That, that's kind of what I'm looking at, I guess, is maintaining relationships with past students and customers and, and things like that and yeah. trying to build a network where I will have repeat business because I, I think that's that's the way of the future for, for my business. I do a lot of private lessons and yeah. things. I also work in disabilities at the moment. So I have a I have this kind of randomly fell into my lap, but I teach okay. a weekly class of photography for uh, people with disabilities. And so that's been quite fascinating. So part of my accreditation in Tasmania, I'll be doing a, a little, another little accreditation for disabilities. Uh, and so that'll be interesting because Excellent. I'm very open to that as well. Well, I wanted, wanted to actually uh, touch on the accreditation and the accreditation process. How important do you think that sort of tourism accreditation in particular is to the photo tourism industry and what does it what does it actually take to obtain accreditation because I don't think a lot of people understand what accreditation is or you know how it works yeah, yeah so so Tasmania I mean it's very important to them to be doing the right things to be protecting the environment um, people having insurance, you know, they, they want to know that people going there are going to take care of the areas they go yeah. to. Uh, and uh, in my times in Tasmania, I've seen a lot of photographers and I still continue to see a lot of photography that I know people have climbed the fence and they've, you know, trumpled down another path that that's not open to the public or whatever. Yeah. And I, I'm not really that, I'm not really that photographer. I, I just think if people can, I don't know, I, I'm just, I believe in protecting nature and things like that. So yeah. the accreditation process, you know, it is time consuming, it costs money, and it involves a lot of paperwork, mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of paperwork and answering questions like, you know, do you have a disaster plan if something happens? Do you, you know, what happens if someone gets injured? What happens if this, you know, just to make sure that you actually care about the people you're with uh, that you're yeah. responsible for and, and what do you do in the case of a, an emergency or an accident or you know things like that and uh, yeah so it is a long process it's also to do with parks and wildlife uh, you know yeah. I have to pay entry fees for all my clients and that's another thing I've really seen in Tasmania especially is little tour groups toodling around and no one's got any kind of authority <laughs> from yeah. parks and wildlife or, or accredited or anything and I don't know I guess uh, I'm not very happy about it I'm not a dauber either but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, just, I just think people need to kind of work a little better I think it's really unfortunate that there's a lot of cowboys doing things like that yeah, no, I, 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 I'm definitely with you there I think and a, a big part of that is as you said you know, right at the beginning, uh, talking about the uh, the the way that or the impact that tourism can have on the environment. You know, and sure. you you see some places, particularly some of the overseas places, that get you know so you know the tracks are so worn down now, and you know people leaving yeah. rubbish around. I remember um, I was talking to uh, somebody over in the UK, and uh, I don't know if you know Dirtle Door, which is no. down on the south coast. It's sort of like Sort of like um, the the UK's equivalent of the Great Ocean Road, the Twelve Apostles oh, okay. thing. That, yeah, you know, that it's that yeah. sort of thing. It's not sea stacks. It's actually a um, an arch. Oh uh, yes. Anyway, but uh, yeah. So the, the the usual shot is from the top of the cliff, and uh, yeah. I, I saw. I, I was talking to this person, and they just said it was just uh, they were horrified when they turned up there yeah. because. 
you know, there was just rubbish strewn all over the place. There was, you know, yeah. people just not really taking care of the place at all. And I, I think, yeah. you know, the the photo industry has a lot to answer for, but also a lot of responsibility that can it, it can take, you know. And it's, you know, drawn by things through social media and so forth, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I, I think a lot of people just, that they don't realise what, those impacts can actually have on an environment and particularly delicate uh, yeah. ecologies in, in places like Tasmania um, and, you know, well, anywhere in the world, really. But, uh, yeah. you know, uh, and I think that... And, and I'm careful about things too. Like I, I was brought up to clean the area that you're yep. in. So if you arrive leave, leave somewhere it. for a picnic leave and it's rubbish, it or better. pick it up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and if you bring your lunch bag in there with your cling wrap, like take it out again when you leave. So even on my daily photography, when I go out for sunrise, I, I always have a some kind of bag, extra yep. bag in my bag so I can pick up rubbish and things like that. And I just think it's the right thing to do. So I always encourage people to do the same. Yeah, Definitely. absolutely. Yeah. No, but going I, back to that accreditation just for a sec, like that has actually opened up a lot of opportunities for me. So uh, part of my accreditation, what, what happened during COVID was um, the tourism industry, obviously in Tasmania was in pretty dire straits and sure. University of Tasmania actually got together with them and said, well, what if we offer your members um, some education for free? So I was invited to do a graduate certificate in tourism, environment and cultural heritage. And so that's what I've been doing the last year. And it's been really fascinating. We were talking just now about over tourism and the yep. environmental impacts. And we've been doing heaps and heaps of study about that. And I find it an incredibly fascinating, uh, fascinating topic. And I'm very curious to see if things are going to improve and change for the better since COVID. Now that we've kind of realized, I don't know if you remember seeing uh, footage of Venice last year, yeah. you know, after all yeah. the tourists went home and then the, the water was suddenly like clear yeah, was, and there was dolphins. <laughs> dolphins in Venice, yeah. <laughs> which, is, which is pretty incredible, really. Uh, but I, I can 100% see how that's all coming from and I guess part of the problem is Instagram and people revealing their locations and and things so I actually don't unless it's like a pretty obvious place like 12 apostles on the great ocean road I don't I don't actually I just I'll just say Tasmania or Sunshine Coast or yeah. on my locations because I feel that everyone doesn't need to know like if you really want to know my location you will go and look for it and find it yourself and, and I, it'll I, be I more it rewarding know anyway from other photos because you know you, you might not have exactly the same composition but you know i mean yeah. belmore belmore falls for example in the um southern highlands here in new south wales it's very recognizable because it has this massive drop for the first fall and then a pool halfway down oh, yeah. and then another fall and you know yeah. somebody takes a, a a shot of of belmore falls you know it's belmore falls you know like yeah no matter what angle you take it from really, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm super careful about that. And, and I get, yeah. I get a bit of aggression sometimes from people if I'm not willing to share the location, but I don't care. I just think it doesn't matter. So I've, I've actually joined, I'm a member of uh, a group called nature first, which is uh, yeah. also about photographers taking responsibility for places. They take people and um, location sharing and cleaning up rubbish and that kind of thing. And, yeah, I think it's I think it's pretty important, and it's definitely something I incorporate in my tours, and and I'm very conscious of of that. Uh, so my tours are very small; like I would never have ten or twenty people yeah. on a tour. I, I would have three, four, five, maybe max. I I think that's a really nice small group size, and it's manageable, and everyone can get to know each other quite well, and that that's more my thing. It's not not the big yeah. tours of people. But I, I think also, you know, and as you know, running workshops, if you have too big a group with not enough instructors, I mean, I've yeah. been on a couple of workshops where, you know, there's been two or three instructors and say roughly, I think, you know, between three and six people per instructor, that's yeah. that's a manageable number. But if you, yeah. you know, if you were trying to manage 10 people on your own, 
It, yeah. You know, it's all, it's almost impossible to give them enough one-on-one -on -one time to actually make, make sure that they've got value out of the experience as well. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So, and and I know some people are really in it to just make the money. And yeah, yeah. to be honest, the, I, the money is, of course, I need to earn money because this is my living, but I, I would never, I don't know, I guess I would never go over that, cross that line and say, I don't care anymore if people have a good time. I'm just going to book them, you know, on the trip. If I get 20 people, great. You know, like I will always take small groups. That's that's just how I, I like more personal, you know, I'm, I'm a very patient teacher, I've been told, and I like to take time with people. And I, yep. the whole idea of them being there is to learn something and to gain from the experience. And if I Absolutely. can't give them that, there's no point in offering yeah. it, you know. Well, they're, they're there to enjoy themselves, you know, first and foremost. Yeah. And so yeah. if you... If you're not giving them an experience that they're going to enjoy, you know, there's little point yeah. in doing it, I think. You know, I mean, yeah, okay, there might be some, you know, dodgy operators out there that are just in it for the money. But I yeah. I, I think if, you, if you're going to get started in something like that, then, you know, you've really got to have a long, hard think about what it is that you're doing it for, you know, and it's not, yeah. can't just be about the money, you know. And, and I'm pretty passionate about, just teaching like I, I sometimes honestly I find it amazing that people are so wowed at my photos and they want to know how because to me it's I don't know it's it's just natural like I look at it and think oh I've got to shoot portrait you know style and I and I've got to put this in the foreground and yeah, so I find it interesting when people try to unpick it and, and make me tell them every little thing because I, I don't actually know sometimes like I've I yeah. just go and set it up and without thought, you know, that's how I like it. So yeah. that's been a challenge for me is how do I put that in words, you know, to help people understand, you know, how I get there. Yeah, you you always get the question, what settings did you use? Oh, I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yeah, okay, I can go and have a look at the exit on the, on the file and whatever, but it largely doesn't matter you know no what? and that's what i teach like I, so yeah. i teach a lot of i sell the nissi filters and i and i teach that is like the number one thing people want to know how do i use filters and yeah. when i remember back to my first time using filters or thinking about filters i had no idea i just i was like wow they look really cool and i like the effects but I don't even know the first thing about you know yeah. i try to watch a little youtube videos and i'm not a very good uh youtube trainer like i'm not good at watching videos and getting a lot out of them like i think oh that's cool but then when it practically i, I don't yeah, yeah, yeah. i don't really get much out of it so to me a one-on-one -on -one thing is much yeah, better lesson. yeah yeah the, the, yeah, the practical yeah, yeah. I mean, and to be honest, I, I've probably got more out of YouTube for processing because you can pause, try it out. Okay, oh, that didn't work the same way that worked on what he did. Rewind it a bit. Okay, oh, that's what I missed the step. You know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think we could agree. Like, I'm not. I'm a very basic Photoshopper. I I just. I could spend hours a day trying to teach myself how to do Photoshop better, but I actually don't. Not that I don't like it. It just doesn't, I don't know, it doesn't come easy to me. It's very, very challenging. And often I try and learn something and then it, like you said, like it, then it doesn't work. And ugh, when I'm watching videos, it just, I just never get anywhere. So I, I guess I've taught myself to try to take the best photo in, in camera yeah. as I can using my filters and, and my settings. And then when I get into Photoshop, it's not like I'm trying to get rid of the sky or I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's no. amazing Photoshop people out there. I am definitely oh yeah, not one of them, there's like. fantastic people, uh, fantastic images created. You know, in composite. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've I've played around a little bit with composites and whatever, but my preference again is to get it right in camera. You know, I so, yeah. somebody asked me, uh, you know, wh whether or not that that image was photoshopped, and I kind of said to him, I said, well, yes, it is, but that's kind of like saying to a chef. Um, can you show me the recipe and yeah. the ingredients, but not cook yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. Because you've got to have a good, you know, you've got to have a good idea about what you're doing to put those ingredients in to get the end result. And, yeah. you know, the, to, to me, the Photoshop's the cooking part and there's techniques yeah. in there that you need to know, but they're not the most yeah. important part. The most important part is what am I cooking and 
what am I what am I putting in the pot? You know the ingredients, yeah. and, and if you've got, you know, it, it's very. I mean, it's it's not that hard. Not as hard as it used to be to fix a poor shot, mm. but if it's out of focus, there's, yeah, there's not much that's going to fix it. Though I think yeah. Luminar AI is talking about uh, something that'll fix fuzzy and out of focus somehow, but. Oh, yeah, no, I tried to, I, like, I really tried to teach people the techniques to have the best, you know, so so they could just take it off that camera and be proud of it without yeah. having to spend an hour on Photoshop. Like, yeah. uh, that's just not my thing. Um, and I don't, I don't ever do composites or anything like that. Um, star trails would be kind of my only. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. My only thing that yeah, I would bit, do that. A bit hard to do them without, uh, you know, stacking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but otherwise, I, I mean, I'm just pretty natural. Like I went out the other day to a local national park, actually, that I hadn't been to because I heard there was wildflowers everywhere and I kind of went crazy. And I just, I loved my shots. I, I didn't even edit them, to be honest. Like I just, I just opened them up in, in camera raw and had a quick look and went, well, there's nothing really to improve. <laughs> they look pretty good to me. So I just loved yeah, them. I, I, I love those shots where you can just bring them up and you go, yep, uh, click, click, done. Yeah. Wave. <laughs> yep. Yep. For sure. So, yeah. so yeah, anyway, getting back to, sorry, accreditation. Um, yeah. I mean, there's a lot more to it. Like you have to have your um, insurances. Uh, they want you to have your first aid and obviously first aid is something like I just did a refresher for my CPR. So yeah. that is an annual thing. It's like ongoing. It's not like yeah, you do all that paperwork and then you're done. Like you have to keep it up to date. They're always requesting something. Well, I, I remember the first time I did CPR would have been in the Boy Scouts in the the late seventies. Yeah. And since then, first aid it's itself and CPR, just, just the process yeah. of CPR has changed. Oh, 100%. I just did yeah. it 12 months ago. And, and that's and it. it. Yeah, every, every 12 months so, they come up with... And, and especially with COVID, you know, COVID has, has uh, made us more careful about, you know, bodily fluids and being oh, absolutely. Yeah. and that kind of thing as well. And yeah. so so that that's all a bit of a process as well. And the other part of accreditation, which I do like, is continuing learning and continuing educating yourself uh, on different different reasons you know like I've done a COVID safe uh, yep. module where you know kind of learn bits and pieces about how to how to make people COVID safe um, on my tours and I have to actually write a lot of answer a lot of questions again like you know what are your processes and, and what happens if this happens and yeah. you know so it does cause you to think a lot and plan a lot and I guess be a more responsible business owner yeah, <laughs> at the end of the yeah. day. Because and I, I think, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's an important part of it. You know, you've, you've really, that, that responsibility that you've got, you know, you actually have people, I mean, yeah, you know, they've got to take their own responsibility for their own safety too, but you are, mm -hmm. whilst they're under your care as part of it too, yeah. they, they are your responsibility to a certain extent. Oh, for sure. And and I and this this brings me back to when I was uh, working in the Kimberley and working on the dive boats, you are responsible really for people when when someone's really sick, or they've cut their leg or they're yep. like, it's, it, they come to you. Yeah, that's <laughs> they it. come to you, you're the expert doesn't matter what it is, you're the expert, you know, because you're the one who knows and and you do have to know a lot of mm. stuff. And, and I like knowing stuff. I like learning and I'm um, yeah, as I said, I'm going to university still now, so I'm I'm quite enjoying that <laughs> as well. Cool. What are, What are you studying at the moment? Uh, tourism. Tourism. Okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah. tourism, environmental, um, and cultural heritage. So it's it's about global issues with tourism. Yep. Um, uh, it's fascinating. Nature. You know, how can we improve things? Um, it's very. It's very focused on Tasmania, obviously, because it's at the University of Tasmania. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. there's a lot of really interesting things in there. Like oh, I didn't realize how much Tasmania depended on cruise ship tourism, for example. Oh, and, and, that's, yeah. and that's kind of, you know, disappeared in the flick of an yeah. eye. So, um, yeah, there, there's a lot of places in Tasmania that are doing very, very tough. Yeah. I, I don't know. I feel a real connection to Ta I really love Tasmania. I, I just think it's a beautiful secluded little place 
well it's an island you know it's, yeah. it's gorgeous yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of particularly the southwest i don't know if you've ever been yeah. there dark iron and that you know the yeah. there's some places there that i'd I, I think very few humans have ever even been to. I'm, in, in fact, I'm pretty sure there are some valleys where no human has actually trodden. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, my definitely my focus is Tasmania and spending more time there. And I have people waiting down there for me to come and run a workshop for them. Yeah. You know, so I still I still cannot get there, but I'll get there eventually, and I'll spend some time down there and uh yeah probably a month or two at a time and just explore just with my camera and and meet up with some of the photographers down there who who i know online because that's that's a great community you know the online community but yeah i'd like to meet people as well in person so so you've uh mm -hmm. done quite a bit of shooting around the world what locations are still on your bucket list other than Tasmania. <laughs> you know, I haven't actually been to Scandinavian countries. So okay. like I I was actually I had a I was three days away from going to Norway and my partner was quite ill and I had to cancel all my travel. Oh. And so I missed Norway and I've always wanted to go to Iceland, places like that. I like snowy, cold places much more than tropical, I suppose. Up the Arctic, you know, Greenland. Yep. Um, there's also Russia, you know, those frozen ice lakes in Russia that I'd love to see. Um, Mongolia, just out in the desert. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I feel like all the places I want to go are weird and remote and <laughs> away from people and and I actually want to do I have a big thing for jetties and piers and so yeah. I I would like to do a trip to the UK and just do all the giant piers that I there's a lot of them so yeah I would I would love to do that and and then I think oh and then there's like northern England and the Isle of Wight <sighs> so many places so many yeah, no, the list is always uh, way longer than there will be time to get. Yeah, it. and I and I actually have a bit of a waiting list for Eastern Canada when when I eventually can run a tour. So we'll we'll see how that goes. I'm not I'm not crossing my fingers for that just yet, but um, yeah. maybe one day, maybe one day I'll do that. Yeah, myself uh, and the the wife were um, looking for last last year. We were planning to do the uh, the Silk Road from oh. Western China all the way through to Georgia. Fabulous. Uh, yeah, but um, that, that's just parked and on hold. Uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that that sort of unexplored sort of, well, it's not unexplored, but, you know, that that, that sort of yeah. landscape that you don't, you don't see a lot of photos of. Um, yeah, and it's a bit off the beaten track. I mean, yeah. as much as I love, like, I love the Great Ocean Road, I think it is absolutely yep. incredible but i i want to go to other places that people haven't seen yeah. and a lot of my travel like i've i've traveled my whole life my whole life and there's a lot of places that i've been to that were awesome and amazing but they were before photography for me so yeah, so yeah. I, I have a couple of snapshots and things but i, but I think oh i should go back there and delve you know more into it and so there's I, I have a massive, massive list of places to go one day. Whether I'll get there, I don't know. But I do love Australia. I've traveled quite a bit around Australia in a combi van and, you know, a, a every other which way possible. So I will get to the Pilbara one day as well. That's yeah, I've, my... I've not been over there. Um, yeah. I mean, Ningaloo Reef and all of that, you know, yeah. Shark Bay. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just beautiful over there. And I still remember from my times in the Kimberley, every fortnight, you know, I'd kind of roll around to Broome and it was like, yeah. oh, look at the ocean. It's just <laughs> incredible. There's so many beautiful places. I mean, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know when we're going to be traveling. I don't think we're going to be traveling like we used to. Yeah. Really, I, I, I don't think, I, I mean, I, I haven't run out of places to shoot in, in Sydney. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was talking to neither have before. I. Neither have I. I've been trying to get to Sydney now for quite a long time again yeah. to shoot because uh, I because I actually love the city. Like I love yeah. urban urban nightlife and all. I think it's pretty amazing. So that's another thing I would like to shoot more of. But I live on the Sunshine Coast where we don't have uh, city lights or nightlife really. So <laughs> I have to wait till I get to a city again. Yeah. 
Uh, <coughs> pardon me. Sorry, I'll just edit all this out. Um, so we all have our uh, inspirational and aspirational photographers. Who's your go-to person when you uh, are looking to extend yourself? Oh, wow. That's a really tricky one because there's lots of genres that within landscape that I think are amazing. Um, I follow a guy in England, Wild Seascapes, I think he's called, and yeah. he does like ocean, you know, just big waves and then beautiful birds flying across. I think it's amazing. I, I actually think you become the expert at your local beach like stuff that you shoot all the time that's when you're the best you know and so for me Absolutely. I guess it's my local beaches here but but that doesn't mean I don't follow other amazing photographers uh maybe more because of their locations you know like I, I'm jealous of their locations and, and I yeah, want it's to funny <laughs> Every, everyone's got FOMO about other people's locations uh, <laughs> oh yeah and people do about mine they're like oh you're so lucky you live and yeah I do love it here but man I, I would like to shoot something different sometimes you know <laughs> well that's it yeah because you, you kind of go oh I've done that done that again yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so ah uh, I don't know. And, and I like, I mean, I really love travel photography. Tra I do a bit of travel photography and I, I would love to do that for a living. You know, I would yeah, love yeah. to just be traveling a lot more, but who knows what's going to happen. No, definitely. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm just sticking closer to home and I'm building up my network. I've been doing monthly Insta meets um, oh. on my local beach and that's had a great response actually. So I find a lot of people don't feel confident shooting alone or, you know, they don't feel experienced enough. And yeah, I, I say hi to everyone. We have breakfast and, and we do a bit of shooting and people can ask me questions like, what do you teach if, if I did a lesson with you and, and stuff like that. So I think it's a very good social and networking event and, and I really like it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm enjoying okay. that. So. I've been to quite a few meets here around the, the the Sydney, getting to know a few people, and you know, yeah, you know, if nothing else, just using it for a bit of bit of networking as well as the photography. You know, I mean, the oh, for sure, yeah, and because I am a to see pre arranged yeah, because you I'm can't, a can't guarantee yeah. <laughs> because I'm a reseller for um, Nissi and Sarui tripods and things. Yep. So so that's also good because some people don't know who to order through and they don't know who to trust. And, you know, when they meet you in person, then they realize, Oh, you're actually a person and yeah. you're a local and I'm going to support that business, you know, and so, you're using the gear and so forth. Yeah. 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 So, so I think that's very handy as well. Um, I follow a lot of drone photography. I'm fascinated with drone photography. I've yeah. had a few drones and I've dabbled in that field and I wouldn't say I'm great at drone photography, but the only drone photography that really fascinates me is the top-down views of things that okay, I, just, yeah. I just love them. I love them, love them, love them. So I don't know. I might buy another drone. I haven't decided yet. <laughs> I've got a guy, if, you, if you're if you interested in something a little bit different, a, a guy called uh, Ty Bowmaker, I think his name is. Mm -hmm. um, he does uh, what he calls drone lapsing. So it's video, but it's yeah. actually a series of still images taken from the drone that he time lapses together. Um, oh, cool. Uh, so, some of those are some some of those are absolutely brilliant. I, I, yeah, I'm, really I, I'm quite fascinated. fascinating in drone photography and how so many young young people are are excelling at drone photography. It's it's yeah. pretty rapid rise to um excellence, I feel and I, and I'm very I guess I didn't grow up with technology, really. Like I'm yeah, in my fifties, yeah. so. But but you got kids in their twenties who could just walk all over it, you know. They, oh, they I've, uh, no, I've, no I've, worries at all picking it up and trying it. Whereas I'm like, oh, what if I touch this button? <laughs> What's yeah, going to happen? I've been totally wowed by some uh, young people that um, I've seen on Instagram and Twitter, like fourteen year old or sixteen year old photographers, and they're just doing yeah. absolutely outstanding work. Stuff that you know. Yeah. I, I couldn't have ever dreamt of, I mean, beside yeah. film days, you know, just yeah. I'm, I'm still envious of it, looking at what they're doing and going, wow, I wish, wish I was that amazing. good. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, you know, I, 
I believe in learning from people who inspire you. So, so I even followed that when I started photography, I thought, you know, I'm not going to waste my money doing different workshops every weekend. Like if, if someone isn't wowing me with their photography, I don't really want to learn anything from them. And, and I've kind of stuck with that. So I've, uh, I've done a few workshops with portrait, you know, masters and things like that. And I had a, I had a mentor for a very short time um, with it with a pretty amazing landscape photographer and and that was that was pretty good as well so I I really like to tell people you know if if you think I have something to teach you like if you want to know what I do to get the shots that I get come yeah. on a workshop you know and, and I'll tell you everything I don't it's not smoke and mirrors like it's oh. basic anyone can do it but you just you have to practice a lot. I mean, I've gone two or three years going out every single sunrise, yep. you know. And that's 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 exactly the 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 way that people learn is that repetition. You know, you yep. constantly going out, looking at what you do. You know, saying, "Oh, it didn't quite nail that." You know, whether it's focus or whether it's yeah, or whether it's shutter speed or whatever. You know, and yeah. And I encourage people too, like if if you get out on a regular basis, you start to learn how to um, change your settings on your camera without even really looking at your camera. Yeah. Like it becomes sort of automatic, so you don't have to sit there with your head torch on and you know light up the whole countryside to yeah. try and fix the setting on your camera because you know that that finger on that dial will do the job and yeah. uh it's just, just familiarizing yourself i guess with your equipment which i think is um fantastic it's, because it, you know, it, it's absolutely i think the, the yeah it, I, I think it's probably the most important lesson that you can learn in photography is understand your gear and so yeah. that as you say, you know, you're not turning the, the the head torch on or whatever. You can do it in the dark. You know, yeah. you know where where your settings buttons are just by feel. And yeah. I think if you if you just practice that, you go a long way to learning how to use your gear better because you know, you know, you you know where your your buttons are. You know where your dials are, and you know. Well, it becomes better. more instinctive. You know, like Absolutely. you just automatically yeah. go there. And and the other thing I teach people is get if you're going out for a landscape, like get there an hour before sunrise, not five seconds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you get there an hour before, you can actually set up, make sure you know what you're doing with your camera. You know, have everything ready. And so yeah. when the light explodes and the sky is amazing, you're, you're not like, going mad, going oh my god, I'm not set up back. yet yeah yeah so often i'm very early and sometimes uh i'm already taking a few shots test shots just seeing if i like the composition and you know i'm following the light and oh you really notice you know winter to summer how the sun is in a completely different direction yeah, it always definitely. amazes me i'm like i'm sure the sun came up over there oh no but maybe that was summer <laughs> so yeah i'm not i'm not very big on following like uh apps like photo pills and clever yeah, yeah. apps like that that give you every last detail i just kind of go i'm going to the beach this morning and i feel like shooting this jetty and i just go there and, and wing it and see what happens sometimes yeah. not the great conditions but you still learn from those conditions Oh, like absolutely. You know, I, I, I've had some great experiences in what I would have thought, you know, if, I, if I'd if i known what it was going to look like, I probably would have stayed in bed. But, you know, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but there are some great times that I've had in, in what looked like really horrible conditions and got some really nice images out of them. I mean, remember one at uh, North Narrabeen and literally I think the sun appeared as a kind of red dot on the horizon mm -hmm. between the horizon and the cloud for about 30 seconds and yeah. that that was the total color for, yeah. <laughs> for the morning i know it's it's pretty it's nature that's what i love about it i just yeah. I don't, i'm always amazed at some photographers and they go oh yeah i was looking at the cloud apps and it looks like it's going to be high cloud and there's this and that and i just go you know i'm just going to go out or not go out like i, I don't i couldn't care less with the app oh, I, 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 what, what i do look at is tide times when i'm yeah, shooting on, yeah. on the ocean so i always look at tide times but everything else you know whatever <laughs> I, I look at the apps but the main reason i do that is largely to decide where i'm gonna where i'm gonna shoot because yeah. if it's if, if I know it's going to be high cloud and, you know, it, it, then it doesn't matter where I go, mm. you know, but there are certain, yeah. you know, if, if I want, you know, a certain 
uh, astronomical. Yeah, if you've got a shot you know, planned, uh, yeah. Uh, sure. I'm planning that shot, then I'll then I'll spend a bit of time planning it. But a lot, yeah, yeah a lot, a lot of what I do, I don't plan, you know, a, a, a long time ahead. There's a couple I of. I think shots. it's more fun that way. I, I just. Oh, and yeah. that's why yeah. To be honest, that's why I shoot alone a lot of the time. I really enjoy shooting by myself, 100%. But um, what it means is if I have a, a, a plan to go somewhere and I get there an hour before sunrise and I go, oh, my God, that's clumpy cloud. I hate it. I'm going to go here. I can just take off and go somewhere else. I still have time to get there nice and early. But that's when you're it. with other people, you're kind of bound to stick in that group and I, I find it a bit stressful and and for yeah. me it's uh, it's my morning meditation going to take photos so sometimes I do take people along or, or meet up with people um I guess as a female photographer it's the safety aspect of I know so, that some places I, I wouldn't go alone in the dark or um that kind of thing but generally I much prefer to be just by myself and then I'm free to do whatever wherever I go uh, I'm not bothering anyone or, or waiting for people or. Yeah. No, I know. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> so what have, uh, sorry, what, what's the most memorable experience you've had uh, when out shooting? Oh, wow. Most memorable. I would probably say when it's, uh, when I fractured my vertebrae and fell. Oh. Yeah. That was on a, uh, on a local beach, they have these big sandbags that they put up as um, like breakwaters. And yep. after a little while, the sandbags kind of harden up like concrete. They're, they're fully hard. Yeah. And I was on top of one of them just shooting, starting to shoot sunrise. And I I slipped and fell down on the next level on my tailbone. And oh. I, yeah, it was pretty scary because I couldn't breathe and I started hyperventilating and I was in a lot of, I don't know what was happening. I thought I bruised oh. my tailbone, but actually the shudder, like the effect from hitting my tailbone went all the way up my spine, you know, towards my neck. And yeah, so that was pretty tough, but I did save all my gear. So my gear was okay. <laughs> Uh, and then I kind of hobbled to the car park. So it was quite a lot of sand I had to trudge through and I couldn't stand up. So I was oh, all wow. hunched over and just, um, yeah. Anyway, ambulance and six weeks on my back. My um, goodness. So I will never forget that. And no, it's not that... really so much about, it's not so much about being careful. Like I'm always careful, but that's why they call it accidents. Like accidents happen. And I suppose in that way, shooting by myself is probably not a good idea because if something happens to me and I'm all alone, you know, what next? But I'm, I am pretty careful and I know how to manage my risks. You know, like I know this beach, the rocks are super slippery, so I'm going to wear particular shoes or, you know, I'm pretty good at managing that risk. Um, but obviously, yeah, accidents happen. What can you do? I mean, no. yeah, that was... That was pretty bad. I mean, I couldn't walk. I wasn't allowed to walk for six mm -hmm. weeks. So that was, that was hard. That's amazing. <laughs> I did a bit of macro. <laughs> did yeah, a macro guess, in the yeah. garden. <laughs> and how, how long, is it okay now? How long did it take to recover? Yeah, yeah. So I fractured two vertebrae and yeah, six weeks on my back and, and they did heal. They did heal. So oh. apart from that, you know, I, I would actually say, memorable things to me are like places I've been to and and so Antarctica would be my number one uh, amazing and and I didn't even take that many great shots to be honest because I signed up for the sea kayaking um yep. part, portion of it which was like quite a big investment and I was terrified and it was amazing because we were following minky whales and like That's it was just it was the most incredible experience, but it was really difficult to have a camera on the kayak. So I was in double kayak with my partner, but yep. um, you pretty much had to be paddling both of you most of the time. Like the conditions can be, they can change in an instant in yeah, Antarctica. Yeah. So you could be on a glassy, calm lake one second, and then the next second you're just paddling like buggery to, to, get, to get out of there because the winds picked up. So a few people ha on that trip had lost their cameras, you know, oh, over yeah. the side, never to be seen again. And I had a little, like a Nikon underwater compact camera that I had looped around my neck probably, but I really didn't take any photos, but the memories of that will yeah. never, you know, they'll never go I, away. I, I think some of the best experiences is when you, I mean, not necessarily when you don't have the camera, but when you're actually just enjoying 
nature and what's oh, yeah. going on around you rather than it trying to capture incredible. it. Incredible. And you know what was amazing about that trip was there was no internet either. So oh. I actually really enjoyed that because if there is internet, I'll be on it. Like I'm on Instagram, you know, a couple hours a day, really. Yeah. So that was excellent for me. I, I thought that was brilliant not having yeah. internet. I highly recommend it. <laughs> if you if you are forced to do it, it's really good. <laughs> oh, nice to take a break from it occasionally, I think. Definitely, most definitely. So have you ever hit a creative wall? Uh, yeah, I guess I sort of lost my, I, I, I used to go out for sunrise every day, like I said, for quite like a year or two probably. And then, I don't know, for some reason I started sleeping in a bit and getting up when the sun came up and that was really nice. And I just kind of lost track for a while, didn't want to get out much, kept thinking, oh, so tired of going to the same beaches. And <laughs> I just took a little break for a while, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and then I try and shoot something different. So that's when I'll go bush, you know, and try to do some macro flowers or uh, things like that. And yeah. I find it really interesting to be teaching other people, especially in this, um, with my people with disabilities, because they have a, a their own unique view of things and so sometimes that can stir something up that that gives you a bit of creativity uh, i have one lady on one of my classes and she actually shoots very similarly to me like not landscape necessarily yeah. but she just has her camera and often i look at her photos of things that she's seen on our walks and i think wow i would have taken a photo of exactly that same thing yeah, wow. whereas other people take completely different things and, yeah, and yeah. think they're fascinating so we did one class, I remember, where I was finding drains, you know, like just drains in the ground with the, okay. with the grid. Yep. And some of them have numbers and some of them have like letters punched in and some of them have colors. And we just did a whole class on that. They were just laughing at me. They were like, there's something wrong with you. What's <laughs> but actually, they did the class and were like, they were quite surprised that there were so many interesting drains around the neighborhood. Wow. <laughs> so, to yeah, be honest, so, I, I, I don't think many people look at them. So, no, yeah. they don't. I even found some with my exact initials on them. So I don't even know how that happened. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just, just fun, I guess, when you get, when you lose your creativity with something like for me, obviously landscape would be my number one. I just take a little break or I try to go to a different location. Yeah. Or yeah. I try to go out with someone like a friend of mine or someone that that I know shoots differently or or thinks differently or whatever. Um, that can help as well, just bouncing off ideas or seeing what they come up with. Um, that that can be quite good for your creativity as well. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. So have you um got any particular photographers that you think I should be talking to on the podcast? You should talk to this lady in Sydney, Kathy Wallace, that she shoots like urban uh, architecture. I've seen Kathy's work, yes. Yeah, um, yeah, she's yeah. great. So I was able to meet her last time uh, I got to Sydney last year, finally, to visit a family member. And I met up with her. We sort of knew each other online. And yeah, she took me out to, to look at a bit of architecture. And it was it was awesome. Like it was so much fun. And for me, it was something very different. Like I, I always like architecture, but I don't really, I guess I don't really think to shoot it very often. So yeah, yeah. that was, that was actually very good for my creativity for sure. So yeah, definitely hanging out with people of different genres, I think is a clever yeah. idea. I, I, and I think that that's, that's important. Um, I mean, you mentioned uh, you sort of worked with uh, a portrait photographer and an, you know, I mean, even looking at other art forms and the way that light gets used, I, I think, yeah. you know, that it, it's a really good thing to look at those different genres of, of art in general. But, you know, look yeah. at the way, you know, painters use light and look at the way that, you know, portrait photographers are, are using light. And, you know, you, yeah. can, you can bring lessons from that back into your, into your landscape photography. Yeah, and, and trying to, well, that's right, understanding light, because landscape photography is about understanding light as well. Like if if you're shooting into the sun, what happens? And if the sun is coming in from the side, it's going to yep. light up that side of the mountain. And I mean, there's so much amazing light early in the morning or, or late in the day. I, I'm much more early morning person, but um, 
yeah, light is incredible. It's incredible. So this this one thing I did with a portrait photographer is we we did some natural light portraits and just using shat like harsh shadows. It was the yeah. middle of the day, but we had these awesome angles coming down, you know, next to her face and. It was quite uh, an interesting way of looking at things, to be honest. Because you don't you don't know what you don't know. So yeah. there's nothing wrong with learning and and learning from other people. So oh, yeah. Totally. So if you weren't a photographer, what would you be? Ooh, I don't know. Actually, this has been my problem my whole life. I have never really known what I want to be. <laughs> <laughs> and I've worked in hospitality and tourism and uh, business, you know, office work. Um, I've studied business. I would probably, to be honest, I would go into something involving tourism. I, I, yeah. I love tourism. I think it's fascinating. I love travel. I mean, when I was younger, I wanted to be a flight attendant. That was my thing. But um yeah, I, I'm actually blind in one eye, completely blind oh, in one okay. eye. So um, flight attendant was was not going to be on the cards for me, it's unfortunately. Yeah, it's, a, it, it's, it's not all glamour either. <laughs> no, no, especially now. But but yeah, tourism, I, I find it really interesting how people choose to travel and, and what they're looking for. And I, I like the study of people, like anthropology, I find really fascinating and just the culture of people. So definitely something to do with that um uh, I guess I could probably be teaching more I, I do quite a bit of teaching and speaking at camera clubs and I I really enjoy teaching like I love uh, I just like when people get a light bulb moment or if they learn something that that they were stumped with uh yeah I, I get a lot of enjoyment out of that yeah no great great um I've got one more question and it's probably yeah. the, the the most important question do you like pineapple uh -huh. pizza? What's that? You like pineapple on pizza? Uh, no. No? <laughs> Definitely not. You can't have warm pineapple. It just tastes Oh, no. <laughs> no. No, no, no. I'm a big, like, I, I only like three things on pizza. Pepperoni, mushrooms, and raw capsicum. That's Fair it. Enough. Fair enough. That's my favourite pizza, and that's what I eat. No pineapple. No, no pineapple. <laughs> Pineapple is wrong. It's no, no. It's a very divisive issue. This, but uh, I think it's it is important. a divisive issue. <laughs> it's important that we uh, we find out and get to the bottom. Yes, we got to find out the details of important questions, and it's a no from me, my friends. Fair Definitely. Enough. So don't ever invite me over for pizza with pineapple. Uh, it's okay. I'm <laughs> I'm 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 fairly neutral on it. If it's the only pizza around, maybe, but. Yeah, oh, like, I would still pick it off. I would yeah, still it's pick not it what off. I order. Oh, no, I wouldn't pick it off. I, I don't know. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> very good. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks very much, uh, Vaughn. It's been fantastic talking to you. Um, yeah, it's been really enjoyable. I do like to talk, you may have noticed. So <laughs> it's good. <laughs> well, that's fine. That's what, that's what this is all about. So. That's what podcasts are for, isn't it? That's People exactly like to talk. <laughs> It would be a, a pretty boring podcast if neither of us spoke. <laughs> it would be. Good point, good point. I like it, yep. So where can people find your work? Uh, so I'm on Instagram, Vonda Craswell Photography. I'm on Facebook. Uh, I have a website, vondacraswellphotography.com, uh, where I have galleries and things like that. Um, and you can reach out to me. I have people asking me questions quite a lot on Instagram and, and yeah, I'm on there quite a bit. So chances are I'll respond pretty quickly from, yeah, people wanting to know what gear I shoot with or what settings I'm using or whatever, or just want to say hi, I'm always around. And yeah, I, I, I plan to make this photography bizzo a career for myself for, for quite a number of years. So I'm still plugging away at it. And if you think I can teach you something, come and see me. I can. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Vaughn. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. No problem. Thanks All again right. for listening to the Landscape Photography World. I hope you enjoyed the show and keep listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. You can find my work and this podcast at grantswinburnphotography.com. I'm also on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. I'm Grant Swinburne and hope to see you out shooting soon. Mm -hmm.